wow, like what a picturesque place to grow. Oh yeah, man, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So we're right around 9,000 feet. So we're technically high elevation grow, yeah. which is like very unheard of. Very unheard of. Very Normally unheard it's sub-basement grows. Oh yeah, sub-basement grows all over the world. <laughs> 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 Look at that. So this is Fire Alien Urkel. Fire Alien Urkel. I call it Farkle. Well, Canada, we came to Colorado to show you what a regulated marijuana industry can look like. The next Canadian federal election is to take place October 2015, and one hot-button issue which is causing a good deal of debate is the legalization and regulation of marijuana. The current conservative drug policy is a restrictive one. In 2014, the Tories produced an ad campaign which outlined that marijuana is unsafe and legalization will allow for children to gain access to it more readily. Justin Trudeau, he's in way over his head. The Liberal Party's leader, Justin Trudeau, has cited that legalizing the drug would allow for regulation and taxation. If we control and regulate it the way one controls and regulates alcohol, for example, uh, it actually becomes more difficult for underage people to get it. The current laws in Canada allow for those with doctor's approval to have access to medical marijuana through a licensed producer delivered by the mail. However, this process is very complicated and slow. To get around the delayed process, medical dispensaries have begun opening in cities like Vancouver and selling to those with doctor's approval. But this system is far from ideal. We went to BC to find out why the Conservative government is so keen to attack this rich resource and what Canada is losing without taxation and regulation. We then make our way to Colorado to see how legalization has been successful and how far behind Canada's government really is when it comes to the business of weed. I had record-breaking arrests and interdiction of supply. It took six to eight billion dollars worth of marijuana off the streets a year here in Vancouver. I didn't make one iota of difference in the amount of marijuana that was available and the consumption rates here in Vancouver. Uh, looking at the tax revenue, if you went towards a legalized, regulated route for the adult use of marijuana at the recreational level, I think those advantages are, are far outweigh some of the negative consequences of uh, where we are now. Another person pushing Vancouver towards a more progressive model is Councillor Kerry Jang, who's aiming to regulate the city's grey marijuana market. As a councillor, you know, we're, we're tasked with setting policy for the city of Vancouver, whether it be, you know, how we fix the roads, what new sewer systems, all the way through, as we see now, uh, marijuana policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, become a, a new role for the city of Vancouver, one that was actually thrust on the city because the federal government has actually just walked away or made things so difficult for folks that, uh, you know, the city has to step in to fill that void and show some leadership. Well, you bring up marijuana policy, and one of the things we're here to discuss is the current marijuana situation in Vancouver. And one of the things we noticed here are obviously a lot of dispensaries. And we've been told these dispensaries operate in what's called the gray area. Can you explain that to us a little bit? Vancouver has had a very long history of compassion. Mm -hmm. So we had about six marijuana, medical marijuana shops in our town, and nobody ever complained. But over the last couple of years, particularly the last year and a half, we went from six to over 80. There are more pot shops than Tim Hortons in the city of Vancouver. Whether it's the richest neighborhood, the poorest neighborhood, it doesn't really matter. So clearly there's a demand for marijuana throughout Vancouver. So the city of Vancouver, of course, can't write new bylaws. We can't write any business license or, or create a new category because technically it's illegal. Mm -hmm. If we were to write a business license, we'd be breaking the federal law on uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. And if we shut them all down, the other problem is, of course, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Make no doubt, there are people who are recreational users who are getting it through these shops and all that kind of stuff. But if you shut them all down, you would be blocking people who are legitimate users from their medicine, and that's not right. It costs us money to monitor all this. We have to recover those costs somehow. And so that's what we set our, t our staff off to do, is to figure out some way we can regulate something that's not quite legal in our city. In spite of Councillor Jang insisting that Council couldn't issue business licenses for this grey market, shortly after we left Vancouver, they initiated a plan to do just that. These regulations have caused Canada's Health Minister Rona Ambrose to remind Vancouver's mayor that dispensaries are illegal, which has some people worried that the RCMP could intervene. 
you know, looking at Vancouver, I think you would assume that the rest of Canada would be this progressive, but it's not necessarily the case. <laughs> been to Winnipeg? Well, been to Toronto, <laughs> where I'm from. <laughs> One year after release from United States federal prison, Canada's Prince of Pot, Mark Emery, has now had a chance to observe the current state of cannabis in the country. What kind of changes have you seen to the business? Like other, other than, I guess, the obvious technological changes? No, the biggest change is big money. Big money has come into the industry. I mean, there are people who have been buying and selling and growing marijuana for money in Canada for about 45 years. So there's always big money, but what we're seeing is big institutional money, hedge funds, stock market, IPOs. I would say billions and billions of dollars are being put through conventional legal channels into essentially a marijuana field. Now that's unusual. So ironically, even though Stephen Harper has made a lot of noises about being opposed to the marijuana culture, in his last three or four years, we've had more marijuana produced than any other time in Canada's history, so I, maybe he's content with that legacy. One Canadian who is content with their cannabis legacy is master cultivator Remo, the urban grower, who has been internationally awarded for his efforts. I'm the only Canadian to have one of these. This is a first place cannabis award. Nobody else in Canada's got one. A silver medal from the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam. So do you medicate before you uh, tend the garden always? I medicate pretty much all day long. These are uh, smell barriers, basically. Oh, you can... <laughs> now you can smell it, Oh, right? you can definitely smell it. Okay, well, you might want to stand back. Whoa! Now I know why you wear sunglasses. Yeah, well, it's, the future's so bright, you gotta wear shades, right? <laughs> Absolutely. There you go, Damien. Excellent. Oh yeah, look, look at the colors, though. It's white balanced here now. It is! That's Girl Scout cookies. Yeah. That's a, that's a chemo. So have you ever thought about what it would be like, if you're, because you're just growing for three patients at this point, what it would be like to grow on a commercial level in somewhere like Colorado or Washington State, like somewhere it's legal to have recreational, commercial grown marijuana now? Oh, we, we've totally thought of that. Actually, um, part of my uh, company's business plan is actually to go down south and we're actively talking uh, with a bunch of different growers. I can't really tell you anything because uh, our deals aren't finalized, but we're uh, gonna have Ramo brand dispensaries and grows in the state, in Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and wherever cannabis is legal, we're gonna be there and probably sooner than later. Well, like BC Bud, right? Yeah. Like there's a reason. Well, we're gonna bring BC Bud to the masses and what you see here is our testing ground. This, uh, this is where we've been practicing for years, decades. Despite Remo's weed growing prowess, becoming a licensed producer, or LP, of medical marijuana in Canada is difficult and expensive. That's why he's gotten into a much less restrictive business, pot nutrients. Whoa! Here it is. This is where we store all our finished products. We have seven products all together, uh, six for flowering and five for vegging. That would take you through all the stages you need till you're ready to cure the cannabis, right? Yep. Absolutely, yeah. We took a look at the whole process of becoming an LP and, and it was it was going to be impossible. Mm -hmm. Essentially, unless you're the multi-million dollar facility, mm -hmm. you can't have access to that. And we thought, well, you know what, we can do it this way. And we didn't have the regulatory issues that you're going to have as an LP. You know, we can ship these nutrients anywhere in the world. And actually, I think the profit um, is equally as good with the nutrients as it is for growing cannabis. It seems like nutrients would be a logical choice to apply the skill sets sort of garnered from being a medical grower. Oh, absolutely. And applying it to, a, uh, I guess, a adjacent industry. How difficult is it now running a cannabis business in Canada, looking at what's going on in America, would you say? Well, the American <laughs> market's so much bigger than our market. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer to aim this whole business at America. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, you've seen this kid go out today. That was going to California. There's definitely a lot more opportunities that we can get involved with. America is the land of opportunity for us. Well, thank you guys so much for showing me around. Our pleasure, no, not a problem. We also met the inventors of the sublimator, whose innovations have led them to a less restrictive way of accessing the marijuana market. Hey, is the dude fucked up? Yeah. What's up, man? How's it going? Good. Nice to meet you. We are at Canna Clinic. They're a very progressive um, dispensary uh, organization in Vancouver, and they have 
many locations do they have? They four, have five? They have four or five uh, locations, three with sublimator bars in them. There is vaporizer out there. There's a lot of company that does vapor out there. We're the first one that actually trapped that vapor particle and under vacuum uh, atomized it and uh, frack it into a particle. And you're making uh, one that's compliant with Health Canada right yeah, now. Yeah, right now, that's the one, that's the, that's the secret. Uh, Health Canada contacted us um, six months ago. They said, all right, we know what you're doing. Uh, we like the product. We know it's, uh, we know it's a type two uh, medicinal device. Now we would invite you please to try to make an application to be part of our national... Uh, but to make it compliant or yeah, national so compliant so regulation. we can become a medical, a fully medical authorized unit, like the volcano is at this moment. But we would be the first Canadian fully medical unit that's got all these uh, functionality on it. Ironically, while the federal government has approached Enrico to collaborate on a legal medical marijuana device, he was arrested last year by provincial police in Quebec for selling pot seeds. It was not a very negative publicity. The sale went up the roof, so. At this point, a lot of people that are entering the industry aren't necessarily people that come from the cannabis community. Is that a weird, frustrating thing to watch happen? Or do you think that's just the reality of this? I, 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 think, I think that's the reality of opening up a market. And, it's, and I think that's the wonderful thing, is that it encourages new people to, to come aboard. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a new industry. and. And I, I think it's just like anything, it's going to attract a lot of straight money. And with that straight money comes a lot of straight influence. And with that straight influence comes a lot of progress in Parliament. So really, it's not such a bad thing. There's a certain amount of money that comes in. You have to find the right level because if you overtax, well, then the black market comes in anyway. Uh, but finding something that actually works, and you know, there's lots of models around the world. Sure. Colorado's one yeah. that, uh, uh, that we can look at. We've come to Colorado to see what life is like post Amendment 64, to see the pros and the cons of legal marijuana. We've got cheesequakes, one of our more popular ones. Cheese Strawberry nightmare. Can I get a 100 milligram boulder bar, please? And can I also get two grams of the Bubba Tom Hayes, please? Cool, so it'll be 48, 46 for you. Anything with THC in it has to leave in one of these. If you get pulled over or whatever, it's considered an open container if you don't have it in there. Thank you very much. Success, that's gotta be the easiest drug transaction I've ever had anywhere in the world. Canada, why can't it be this easy back home, you know? Smell that, it's weird. Yeah, no, it smells like cuc cucumber water or something. Yup. There's something, yeah, definitely. Like, I said cucumber the first time yeah. too. Charlotte's Web, you know, is a very small, stocky plant, and it doesn't need any love, really. Yeah. You can just water the thing, and it'll grow. Whereas, like, sativas and indicas, you know, you gotta be, like, on them, you yeah. gotta be tricking them all the time, and being like, <laughs> grow now, stop growing, flower, die. You know, like, these ones, just they just do it. They don't care. The Stanley Brothers are arguably the most prominent marijuana cultivators in America. They patented Charlotte's Web, a cannabis extract that's incredibly effective in fighting epilepsy. We went to meet them at their office and had a chance to see their greenhouse marijuana grow and research laboratory. Anyone who knows about us, they know of Charlotte's Web. There's pre-Charlotte's Web and there's post-Charlotte's Web. Before Charlotte's Web, you know, um, we thought we were really busy and we certainly were and we loved what we did. And after the story of Charlotte, that, I mean, that changed the conversation nationally. It wasn't something that we thought was going to hit this way. We didn't do it specifically for epilepsy. A lot of people think that we did, but... We're not it, that smart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do we do? Quadruple, you know, more, I don't know, even thousand time production of the plant? Yeah, That's after the Sanjay Gupta pieces, we ended up with a waiting list of over 12,000 people from all over the country, all over the world, many of them from Canada as well, who wanted to try this product. If, if people are sold or not sold on the medical side or whatever they think about recreational, it's definitely obvious that we weren't doing any good by throwing people in jail. The plant was still available and prevalent, and now you are seeing contribution to society by way of taxes and jobs and employment and people that don't run around in fear that they're gonna get their door kicked in. Um, so I think this is a beautiful thing economically. I think that that argument is there now. I think our company is one of the many that, that shows this is actually a good thing. 
Andy Williams was another entrepreneur pleasantly surprised by the yields of his investment in the legal green market. Uh, my brother and I are serial entrepreneurs. I failed miserably many times, uh, so it made me have a, a job in the corporate world between my failures. As someone who's tried other things in the entrepreneurial world, is this like where you kind of think you found your home, where you're going to lay There's your no hand? doubt about it. Um, I've lost money everywhere else I've been. <laughs> and, you know, we, we definitely make a, a good margin here. Yeah. One of the reasons people like us is that we grow all of our own marijuana, 100% of it. And so if you come here and you like Blue Dream, you're going to get the same Blue Dream every time you come here. And just like McDonald's or, or Starbucks, you get the same burger, you get the same coffee, people like that. You mentioned Starbucks and McDonald's. Do you think there was going to be a marijuana company equivalent? I do, yeah. Um, and we're setting this up to be that. You know, our, our whole model has been high volume at, at the lowest possible price that we can to the consumer. You know, we do try to pass on that savings to the customer, but heck, uh, there's nothing wrong with making money in my opinion. The taxes are higher on recreational marijuana. It is what I call a sin tax. <laughs> Medical marijuana tax is lower. Yes, it is. And I'm a medical patient back in Canada, but my oh, papers don't okay. transfer here, unfortunately. You just bio-recreational. I did. I did. <laughs> I, I took the recreational, and in my hands, it became medicinal. And, <laughs> That's and it, it worked the same. It was amazing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you know, are these So what did you pay, may I ask? Uh, I think it was $60 a quarter, which, looking back in Toronto, where the prices are fairly low in the worldwide market for cannabis, because oh, I- the black market, you mean? The black market. Well, I, it's a gray market in Canada because uh, we don't have a regulated dispensary system, so our dispensaries aren't regulated. They are just operating in a gray market. Oh, so there's no commitment to quality. Charlie Brown is the longest serving member on the Denver City Council. Coming into office in 2001, he has seen the legal marijuana industry develop from its onset. Uh, can you briefly explain your position on marijuana? Well, I was, uh, it was been on the ballot twice in Denver and in Colorado, and I was against it both times, both for medical and both for recreational. But I represent 52,000 people in South Denver, and 54% of them voted for it. And, you know, it's my job to carry out their wishes. How they phrased that question that was approved by the voters was important. It certainly has brought in some taxes. And the way it was phrased, some of that will go to education. You put education on anything in the ballot in Colorado, it will, it will pass. Mm -hmm. And that helped it. I thought we handled uh, the grand opening of marijuana sales, which was more than a year ago, January 1st. I thought we handled it well. I began to, you know, I began to change a little bit on it then to see how well it was going. And uh, pretty smooth. And people were paying the taxes. The people stood in line, man, for three, four hours. Peaceful. And, and, and a peaceful, and calm process. They were waiting to get yeah. even more calm yeah. once they were on the other That's side right. of that line. <laughs> to get calm, patrons had to pay a hefty tax. So uh, for both medical and retail marijuana, uh, we have a 2.9% general sales tax. On the retail side, there's, there's two additional taxes. The first one is uh, a 15% excise tax, uh, and then there's additional 10% tax that's assessed on top of the 2.9% general sales tax. And all those taxes provided Colorado with $76 million in first year revenue. Well, it's here to stay. I mean, if marijuana were put back on the ballot this coming November, it would still pass. And it could pass probably by even more. One of the signs that legalization has become part of the state's culture is perhaps best illustrated by Denver's main newspaper appointing Ricardo Baca as the country's first cannabis editor. So basically we're 10 stories above the intersection of Colfax and Broadway, which is kind of the heart of the city. Uh, you got the state capitol right here, you got the city and county building right there, and the regulations are still being rewritten there and there on a state and city basis. We just got these statistics last month, which were crazy from the state, but more than 5 million edible products were sold last year in, in Colorado marijuana shops. And when you think about that, that's kind of astounding. The stories that you read on HuffPo about Denver having more medical marijuana dispensaries than Starbucks are true. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we lived with it in that kind of proximity, I think a lot of people recognized, wow, this hasn't really changed our, our, our community much. While Colorado has embraced legal weed, the rest of the continent is still steps behind in joining the green revolution. And besides the gray area in Vancouver's dispensary industry, Canada is lagging too.
anybody who could create the bizarre laws they had clearly has no inkling as to what actually is going on. <laughs> I feel so blessed we're here to see this happening and to be on, on the forefront as far as we speak of this whole revolution. I think this whole marijuana thing is a political movement. You know, it's like dominoes in a way. You hit one state and then you hit others. It's if they just begin to drop. That was a big reason why alcohol prohibition ended, was because of the economy. Everybody sees that legalization is on the horizon. This isn't sustainable. This kind of quasi-bizarre illegal legal market, who knows what, or certain people are illegal, certain people are not. The whole thing reeks of injustice and double standards, triple standards. And finally, that hypocrisy is going to get dealt with. We're going to legalize pot, I think, in Canada and the United States within five years everywhere. That is where we all make guesses. People say five years, people say 10 years. Anybody's guess is as good as mine, but what it will do for people, what it will do for economy and for industry will be amazing. And so for Canada or any other jurisdiction, I strongly recommend this move. I believe that it's safe, I believe it's socially responsible, and I believe that everyone benefits.